She spoke from her heart. She mm. talked about how the evil of abortion. People interrupted the speech to stand up and applaud. A lot of them were doing it to stick it to the president and vice president. There's something very specific that the dark night that Mother Teresa experienced meant. It floored us to find out that she had experienced this sense of being abandoned and forsaken. I was stunned by it. But I think the Lord allowed her those experiences so that she could enter into the experience of the poor and their being abandoned, unloved, unwanted, unwelcome. Jim Tui, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to talk to you. Well, this is a blessing. I've watched your work from afar. I admire it. And uh, so it's great to be out here. Thanks for making it out. I know you're busy. You've got a lot of things. Your, your organization, Aging with Dignity. But you're here to tell us about your work and also your incredible friendship with Mother Teresa. Yeah, life-changing and a gift that I hope I never forget the the spiritual richness of what the Lord did. So you have to try to pay that back, right? So. so I have loved Mother Teresa since I was probably 12 years old, and I've admired her. She helped me, inspired me to help start Live Action, my organization. I probably quoted her in more than 50% of every speech I've ever given. I've quoted her speeches. I know you had an integral part in even setting the stage for some of her speeches. We're going to talk about that, but she's a saint. I mean, she's someone that the world loves and admires as a saint. She's inspired millions and millions of people. And you had this incredibly personal and close relationship with her. So I'm very excited because I have a ton of questions to ask you about what that was like. Fire away. All right, so you'll you'll get a bear all in this interview. <laughs> Anything you want to know? I mean, it was. I always felt like I didn't deserve it. So if mm -hmm. I was given this gift, it was a gift that was meant for others. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to share anything. All right, and also I have to say, when I applied to college, you could write a, a letter to to anybody that if you could be have an actual conversation with them in in history or living. And I actually picked Mother Teresa. Wow, as the beautiful. person I'd want to have a conversation with. So, and look what you're doing with your life. It's so <laughs> consonant with what Mother Teresa believed. And I hope lived. so. Yeah, it is. I hope Trust so. Trust me. Maybe you can't see it, but people can. I hope so. That 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 is that would be such a a life well lived. All right. So, Jim, tell me first how you met Mother Teresa. Well, uh, in the book uh, "To Love and Be Loved" mm -hmm. that I just put out, I tell the story in detail. Uh, this quick version is. I was 28 years old working for Senator Mark Hatfield and a, just a very mediocre Catholic, comfortable in my hypocrisy, not following the teachings of the church, willing to ignore whatever I wanted to ignore about it. And uh, But I saw this woman from afar that was seen to be living the gospel, Mother mm -hmm. Teresa. You know, I wasn't, but she was, and I wanted to meet her, you know. And the nice thing about being a hypocrite is you can spot hypocrisy everywhere, you know. So I was mm -hmm. critical of the church, critical of everybody, but I thought, she's the real deal. So... I was overseas on a trip for Senator Hatfield, and I made a uh, arrangement because he knew her uh, to come through Calcutta on the way back from Southeast Asia. And so then on August 20th, 1985, I walk into the mother house. I didn't want to even be in Calcutta. I didn't want to be around the poor, but I wanted to meet her. So I made a deal that I'd go in and see her for one day and then go to Hawaii for five days. So that's where I was, and that's what I did. And, um, well, I she... Bounded out like a schoolgirl after mass. She was everything I wasn't. Focused, sincere, joyful, cheerful. It, she was just an extraordinary presence. There was a goodness that radiated from her. She was 75 that week. She turned 75 that week. And yet there, she just was all about, there, there was an urgency to her. She always spoke of the Blessed Mothers going in haste to Elizabeth. Mm. You know, Mother was always going in haste. So, uh, well, I was smitten. And I, uh, then she came to New York in October, saw her again. I'd gotten, she had told me to go see her sisters in Washington. I had no idea she had sisters in Washington. I had no interest in being around the poor. Mm -hmm. So I, they hooked me because I was single then mm -hmm. and uh, had me volunteering. And then I started doing mother's legal work as she opened the AIDS home. She had immigration problems and then people were trying to use her name. So those were the things I did for her. So yeah, that's how I met her. And um, and her spectacular sisters and priests that I've gotten to know over the nearly 40 years. When you were her attorney and working on her in these different matters, you also traveled with her. At times, yep, I and, did. And you also met with her alongside when she would be meeting with some very important people, yes. including U.S. presidents. Yes. What was her relationship like with, let's start with this, with these very you know VIP 
very well-known people, very powerful people, whether at one point she was meeting with Reagan, President Reagan, when he was president and after she met with the Clintons, she met with Princess Diana. What did you observe about these meetings that she would have? The thing that was extraordinary about Mother was that she treated everybody the same. She was a respecter of authority, so she understood that these individuals had enormous responsibility, just as she did in the position she was. She didn't set out mm -hmm. to head a worldwide missionary order. And then, you know, at the time of her death, she was in 120 countries. So uh, she understood the pressures of leadership. And so when she met them, she was respectful of that. Mm -hmm. But she did not, she didn't show the favoritism. When you talked with mother, she was locked in on you. You know, like mm -hmm. politicians, if you're in a reception in Washington, you know, they're like looking at you and then looking over your shoulder to see who came in and looking mm -hmm. who's more important to talk to and all this. Not with mother. Mm -hmm. She was locked in on the individual she was talking to. And um, and she was she was very direct, very mm -hmm. blunt. She was, you know, very clear about her pro-life stance, you know. She she talked about the evil of abortion. She decried these efforts to try to kill the dying and uh, to dismiss the handicapped as if their lives weren't living. So Mother truly was, her entire life was given to the person of Christ and what she described as his distressing disguise of the poor and the unborn. And uh, yeah, so Mother was fearless. She, When she needed something, she asked mm -hmm. for it. She, you know, I, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I wanted to show the humanness of her because Mother went to confession. She sinned. She could be impatient, stubborn, critical, you know, but she grew in holiness and was sanctified in community life, just like you and I are in marriage, right? You get sanctified in the midst of the kids and all the challenges of life. So yeah, mother mother was great with these figures. When you say she was locked in on every person that she encountered, and that's one of the things I loved about, and I've loved uh, about her writings, about that encouragement of seeing every single person you meet, they are Jesus. Yes. Like see Jesus in every single person you meet, no matter who they are. And of course, the poorest of the poor was her, had so much of her undivided love and through her work with, you know, in founding missionaries of charity. But when you saw her lock, eye, lock onto someone and really see Jesus in them, how did that work when she was also busy? I mean, she was traveling, speaking. She met with so many people in any given day in Calcutta. If she's in the mother house, she's dealing with the dying. They have, they're so needy. Yes. How does that work to be able to be <laughs> fully present with someone and then be on time for the next person? Well, she had extraordinary wisdom. She she mm -hmm. knew how long to be in conversations when someone when she was just very attentive to the moving of the spirit mm -hmm. in in every situation. She really she used to talk about love until it hurts, give until it hurts. She made a mm -hmm. private vow once to re, in April of 1942 to refuse Jesus nothing. Um she she was she'd say to her sisters, "Let the poor eat you up." So she gave everything. You know, she. Uh, I was always stunned by how hard she went at the age she was. I would pick her up some mornings, six in the morning, and be with her the whole day. And I was in my early thirties then, and I'd be exhausted at the end of the day. And I'd pull up to the convent nine at night. There's a long line of sisters waiting for one on one time with their mother, and she'd do that. She'd be up at the mother house till midnight. So she was gifted. With this energy, not everybody has this gift. You know, she was equipped for the responsibilities she had. But it, I mean, physically, I've never seen anyone go at it as hard as she did. She had five heart attacks, a stroke. She had TB. She had malaria dozens of times. This was a tough, gritty Albanian woman. And I try to describe it with the stories their sisters told me that are in the book that uh, put flesh to those to that uh, reflection on mother. She would also, though, have her sisters take time for, obviously, prayer. Like, no work, you're praying now. That's right. They'd have tea time right. every day. Yep. And then my understanding is she'd also have her sisters take, I don't know if it was six weeks off in the summertime, where they would not be serving the poor. They would be on retreat, basically. Did she do this herself? When she's going so hard and there's so many needs, did she do the self-care, we call it, in today's world? But, <laughs> I mean, did she do that? I mean, really, it's not self-care. It's... it's is taking time for your first love, which is Jesus Christ, yeah. directly, you know, in adoration or the mass. What did that look like yeah. for mother? Did she, did she pamper herself? Yeah. I mean, I have, I used to have a picture of her feet right. and I was going to put on the wall of my studio. I haven't done yeah. it. Her gnarled feet as a teen. <laughs> this was a picture on my wall because I thought this is true beauty, yeah. how much she spent herself for love of she others. She took care of her spiritual needs for sure. And yes, the sisters take three weeks every year for a retreat and seminar and some just downtime. 
Uh, she's always talked about you can't give out what you don't have. And so they had a very strict prayer schedule. Mother adhered to it. She would stop her work with the lepers and the poor, walk right past them to go into the mother house for midday prayer, to have her meal with her sisters, to have a community life, to have her siesta. She took them, you know, and so she she lived that. Now, as she got older and the responsibilities grew, uh, she she often had to deviate from that, especially because of all the travel, you know. When I would travel with her, it was extraordinary how scheduled she was. Everybody wanted to see her. This was after the Nobel Peace Prize because I didn't meet her till 85, and that's six years later. By then, she was a worldwide celebrity. Uh, but she always placed Jesus. She said it begins with prayer. And she mm-hmm. said to me once, she said, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. And that stuck with me, that you've got to find time for prayer and and she did. I could, my, some of my fondest memories are seeing Mother in the back of the chapel in the Bronx with her Bible just hunched in the corner reading the Word of God. It was just beautiful to see. She, she knew the Word of God. She loved the Eucharist. She hungered for it. The only requirement she had when she opened a house, she didn't get salaries for her sisters, no health benefits. They get none of this. The only requirement was that the bishop would promise to have a priest say Mass every day in their chapel. And if they did that, she'd come. And so she knew the importance of prayer. And that I think is gave her the balance in her life. A big thank you to our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? It might say USA on the label, but it's not actually from American Ranchers. It's imported and packaged in the United States. Good Ranchers is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranchers, standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. At my house, chicken nuggets are an easy and kid-friendly meal, but I'm concerned about the seed oils and the additives in the brands that we purchase at the grocery store. Thankfully, Good Ranchers has created a new seed oil-free nugget. No other nugget on the market offers a pure seed oil-free recipe that prioritizes your family's health without sacrificing flavor or crunch. And right now, if you subscribe at GoodRanchers.com, for a limited time, you can get a free add-on for a full four years or until the next presidential election. That means that when you subscribe to any of the Good Ranchers boxes, you get to decide if you want free chicken breast, Angus ground beef, applewood smoked bacon, or wild caught salmon in every one of your orders for four years. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. Use my code Lila at checkout to get up to $1,200 of free add-ons. That's GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. You were there when she gave this very, I call it historic speech in 1994, the National Prayer Breakfast before Bill and Hillary Clinton, then President Bill Clinton. And my understanding is you helped schedule that, that you helped make that happen. Yes. Sandy McMurtry and Jan Petrie, two Americans were very close to Mother. Mm. We, we were all in discussions about this trip and Mother coming over. First of all, was her health good enough to mm. come? Second of all... Um, was she going to be used by the Clintons? And the prayer breakfast was not known for being really pro-Catholic, the National Prayer Black Breakfast. It was largely uh, contentious. They'd never worked with Cardinal Hickey in Washington. So there were a lot. There was a subplot to all of that. Uh, but it worked out, and Mother was prepared for it and had written remarks, which she almost never did. I think twice in her life did she read a written speech. But was she that won- the Nobel Peace Prize and the Yeah, she breakfast. had notes at the podium for that. That's right. But every time else when she spoke, it was extemporaneous. Yeah, yeah. and she was uh, she was aware of the, the significance of this gathering, and she knew the president and vice president and their wives, and you know she knew this was a big deal, and she accepted the invite. And I think they brought her thinking, oh, great, she's a celebrity, and she was. Mm. Uh, they weren't prepared for what she had to say that morning. You really think they didn't know that she'd come in swinging? Mm-hmm. Because think- because she was swinging at the Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. Yep. She called abortion the greatest destroyer of peace, and she said it to the world at that time. Yep. And my understanding is when I've tracked her work, she was always very passionately pro-life in every encounter, public opportunity she had. So the fact that she was going to do that at the prayer breakfast, if you knew anything about her, I would think you would know she was going to do that. You you really think the the demo, the pro aborts and the room Democrats were surprised by they wouldn't have her. come. You know, wow! If Clinton and Gore had known, that must have been a God thing, Jim. It that, must have been <laughs> that they were confused. That they I think they thought she would never have bad manners like that. And the amazing thing was she pulled it off. I mean, 
She spoke from her heart. She mm-hmm. sp- p- talked about how the evil of abortion. People interrupted the speech to stand up and applaud. A lot of them were doing it to stick it to the president and vice president, uh, which wasn't particularly Christian, you know. But but they were also uh, emphasizing what she was saying. Mm-hmm. And but yet, mother did it so lovingly. I mean, she didn't do it with the kind of scourge that you would sometimes mm-hmm. see someone give a bitter speech. You know, she said it as the truth and. She met with the Clintons afterwards, and she loved them. She truly did. She didn't. She hated the sin, and she loved the sinner. And and a mother with that morning, she was fearless. She spoke her peace. She wasn't afraid to say it. I just think the people there are so accustomed to the politic that you don't say this. It's bad manners to say this in a setting like this. That you know, well, she wasn't a politician, you know, so she was going to speak the truth. What was, well, for context too, for folks listening, when she gave that speech, this was around the time when President Clinton, then President Clinton was was vetoing the Partial Birth Abortion Act. So abortion was, you know, this is his 90s thing as president for eight years. He he vetoed it, I think, four times. The act that would forbid partial birth abortions, the baby's half-delivered, a viable baby, Mm. you're stabbing the neck, crushing the skull. I mean, really heinous, horrific, sick crime against a baby. And so there's the context, right? This is a very pro-abortion president. And she gave this pro-life speech at the prayer breakfast. I quote her own words in a lot of my speeches to Mm -hmm. this day. Hillary Clinton was in the room. I heard a report that Hillary Clinton pulled out a Um, Mrs. Clinton pulled out like a shopping list or a checklist of some kind and started taking notes as if she was trying to ignore the speech. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you've heard that. I don't, I didn't see her do that. I did Mm -hmm. see President Clinton keep picking up his cup of coffee that was empty and uh, pretending he was drinking it Really, because it was so uncomfortable. I mean, who, how dare she speak that way, you know, to power. So yeah, I don't think they were prepared for that. And mother didn't do it as in a way to be mean and all. She simply... It's like what Jesus said. He said, the reason I was born and came in the world was to testify to the truth, to witness to the truth. That's what mother was doing that day. Wasn't going to change a vote, probably anybody in that room. But uh, And she actually met Mrs. Clinton later, and I write about it in the book. And Mrs. Clinton led the delegation to mother's funeral. Uh, so it was complicated. Mother mm-hmm. had an impact in the lives of individuals that you wouldn't think would care two wits about her. So that was the unique thing about mother was her appeal. And so when she met with Hillary Clinton after the speech, do you know what their conversation was? I don't. The president, Mrs. Clinton, uh, met privately with mother and a woman, Sandy McMurtry, uh, and one sister was there. But I did see mother right after that meeting. She came back to the convent. Mary and I were there with uh, our son, Jamie, who now works at Aging with Dignity. And... um, uh, and I just said, Mother, how was I was dying to know, you know, what was said, how did it go, you know? Well, with Mother, you listen to what she didn't say hmm. as much as what she said. And uh, Mother just said, pray for Mrs. Clinton. And that's what she said. And, and this was years before the scandal. And I'm not sure what all that led Mother to say that, but that's all she said. Uh, so, yeah. Well, you know, Mother also defended life at the end of life, too, you know, hmm. and was very courageous about that. And I'm hmm. sure she'd be mortified now by the the assisted suicide euthanasia movement that's now catching momentum all over the world. and uh, But she had their home for the dying to witness to the sanctity mm-hmm. of life at the end, too. When you were uh, following and learning and helping Mother Teresa for the 12 years you spent with her, uh, you were sharing before the show that she also had a really big role to play in your personal life, obviously your faith life, but also your vocation to marriage. Can you share more about that? Yeah, she had, she had sent me, I write about it in detail again in the book, but she she sent me to Tijuana, Mexico, to live with the MC Fathers to help them get situated because they just moved there and to discern the priesthood. I always saw Mother uh, telling people, to, oh, you should be a priest. She never said that to me, you know, and I was like, well, she reads me right. I'm not worthy. Uh, but I went and spent that time. Just... Someone's got to have the kids, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so... Uh, after the year, I wrote her and I just said, I just don't feel called, Mother. You know, I'd love to be a priest. I don't feel called. So I came, went to Calcutta. I tell these stories, but it, it was... And then I met uh, a young woman that I knew of that had entered the sisters who had left. Mm. And the sisters now wanted to be matchmaker. And so on page 84, it begins the story of Mary. So your listeners can get to love and to be loved. But... Um, 
and viewers, but uh, she she did urge me, and she sent 35 of her sisters to the wedding. You know, I got her blessing. She even told me which day to get married. Uh, and then on the morning of the wedding, we had a chat on the phone, and, and uh, she said she'd make a holy hour. And so mother spoiled me, and I think she saw I needed it. I needed a mother. I was so lost. You just can't, you know, by God's grace. I mean, I just the mercy of God, you know. So mother knew that. But she also knew how much I loved her, and I did. I would have done any—I was like a puppy dog. I would do anything, follow her, just to see her, you know. Mm -hmm. I had such a debt to her. So, yeah. Uh, and then she she met three the three children while we were alive. <laughs> they all have quick stories. One, Jamie, Jamie buttered her. She was holding him, and he head-buttered her. Uh, I'm sorry, Jamie bit her. <laughs> He, he, she had his, her finger and he took it and bit her. Your Louis, firstborn. Yeah, he's biting her. I'm like, good luck telling that to uh, St. Peter. <gasps> you bit Mother Teresa. And Joe head butted her. And then Max's mother gave him a miraculous medal and he ate it. He so swallowed I, it? I, well, he got it in there and I had to fish oh, it out. Man. But she just, he just looked at it. And, you know, Mother thought that was funny. Mother had a great sense of humor. <laughs> I tell some of the stories, but Mother loved to joke. She loved to tease. She, she was. She was everything, you know, what fully was, human. What was one of the funniest things you saw her do or say? Well, she, she, the stories I got from the sisters about, I mean, I would see her laugh at things, you know, she was tickled by, she would tease the sisters, you know, but she, this, my favorite story of her humor, well, the nun bun story I tell you, you can Google that nowadays to see that story because this guy had a pastry that they said looked like mother <laughs> and uh, it came out of the oven, you know? So I, and so they were selling t-shirts calling it the miraculous nun bun and the immaculate confection and all this. So, so mother sent me this going, what is this? You know, they're selling these t-shirts, you know, cause so I, I contacted him. I'd worked on an arrangement, had to bring it to mother's attention. Meaning and, she wanted, she wanted, she didn't like that the t-shirt was being sold? Or? Right. Yeah. Just what she didn't, you know, my job was to protect the use of her image and likeness. And, it, you know, it was kind of, but she, she had a good sense of humor about it, but she was just like, stop it. You know? Mm -hmm. So I, I got with the guy and we negotiated an agreement that they could have it as local folklore. Cause it, be, it was on the nightly news. It was in, it was Did on. Did it really look like her? You know, <laughs> you'll have to look at the <laughs> photo, but you can see it on the internet, but it, 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 so that gets to the point of it, because then I had to brief her on the settlement, and it was 10 weeks before she died. Sister Nirmala, her successor, is there, and I said, Mother, I've been dreading bringing this up, but I have to get your approval. I said, remember that when you sent me that story about the T-shirt that had an image of a pastry that they said looked like you? I was dreading, like, saying, how do you tell someone they look like a Danish pastry, right? And, and I was dreading how to bring it up, and then I said... Uh, do you remember that? And she kind of nodded. And I said, well, I've got it. And she, I said, I've got it. It's a negotiation. And she just interrupts me. And she goes, Sister Nirmal is now the superior general. Put her face on the T-shirt. <laughs> and she just broke it. She loved that. It tickled herself, you know, that she said that. But she would, the ice cream would be frozen at the sister's, you know, so rock hard. And she'd ask the sister to bring her a hammer. And she'd be chipping away at the ice cream, you know. She just... She she delighted. I'd love to try to make her laugh, you know, but she obviously had such a serious side. And then the chapter on the darkness, you know, talks about how she felt abandoned, forsaken, you know. So she, extraordinary. I think the church is going to be unpacking the Mother Teresa Center, which is in Tijuana, San Diego. Um, they're, they're now unpacking a lot of the letters that Mother wrote. And so some of this stuff's going to be available now to the church for your kids mm -hmm. and grandkids mm -hmm. to read and study. So, yeah. I think people are going to learn more and more about that extraordinary woman that walked among us and her friendship with John Paul the Great, the two of them together. I'm so excited to introduce a must-listen, extremely bingeable new podcast brought to you by Coronation Media. The podcast is called Firebreaker and is a fictional rendition of the story of St. George and the Dragon. It was created by fathers to introduce strong Christian heroes for their boys and girls to look up to. And let's be honest, we're living in a time where there isn't an emphasis on moral character of strong male characters for young boys in media. The Princess 2 in Firebreakers is a model of Christian virtue, just like what I'd hope my daughter to grow up to be like. Firebreakers is done in old school radio style with sound effects and is guaranteed to engage your kids. The portrayal of dragons as captivating symbols of evil is masterfully executed. It's kind of like spiritual warfare training for your kids. 
Plus, the podcast features captivating voice performances, including Wizards of Waverly Place star David Henry and The Chosen's Elizabeth Tabish, who plays Mary Magdalene, as well as a full orchestra score by a Hollywood producer, Kevin Casca. The podcast Firebreakers is available on Apple and Spotify for free. So go download it right now or visit firebreakerseries.com. That's firebreakerseries.com. Okay, they just said like four things. I don't know. There have some more questions about. So, well, let's start back to your marriage, Jim, because I, I, I think this is so beautiful that she was this mama to you, helping you prepare yeah. for your own marriage. But my understanding is she also helped you discern marriage. She did. She, Tell me more about that. Well, she just. I, I mean, was, if I had had Mother Teresa when I was dating people and then now dating my now husband to be like, hey, should I marry him? <laughs> kind of awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and like, mother, did you ask her if you should marry your wife? Uh, I did mother. because wow. mother knew Mary and had, and met Mary and uh, your and in, wife Mary. In fact, when Mary was asked to that, told that she didn't have that calling, it, they discerned out as they say. I joke and say she was told she wasn't holy enough. But uh, when she left, uh, I was traveling back. I was living in Mexico when that happened. But when I came back with mother to the U to the U.S. Uh, and came to Washington, there's Mary and she's out of the habit. And I just was like, whoa. <laughs> and uh, she had come to ask mother to appeal the decision. She wanted back in. And wow. and then I see Mary leave that meeting crying. I had no idea what the answer was. I think knowing that she was back in the lay life interfered with my discernment to the priesthood <laughs> a little bit because, you know, this man called me up in Tijuana and he said, did you hear the news? Sister Katrina's out. So you knew her while she was Sister Katrina. I knew who she was, but wow. I just didn't, you know, you stayed, you didn't. you get... like, you can't have a crush on a nun. Nah, you stand, <laughs> stay away, you know. And Mother allowed me around the sisters as a single man in that category. It was, you know, she was very discreet, protective. Mm. So that just didn't happen, but she trusted me. And so I was very careful with that. But I, I knew Mary was, and I tell a great story in there, which George Weigel says is the funniest Catholic story ever, but... You know, we're Tell running. Us. It's too long, and it's also a little colorful. We like color on this show. Oh uh, uh, well, Mary is now. Uh, uh, this is before she entered the convent, and I mm -hmm. saw her there. She was to enter it in two months, or no, in a month. Mm -hmm. And she was directing a play of Our Lady of Lords, and they she had dressed up. This girl Debbie and this girl Nyla both had AIDS. They'd been prostitutes, mm -hmm. drug addicts. But they came to the home for the dying, and they were becoming angels. I mean, it was extraordinary what Mother did with these people and the sisters. And so Mary had them all dressed up, and they'd rehearsed it. And so uh, Debbie is uh, uh, playing Bernadette, and Nyla is playing the Blessed Mother. And Nyla is was to, you know Debbie used to say, "Who are you?" And they had built a grotto and all this. And so, "Who are you?" And then Nyla uh, was supposed to say, "I am the Immaculate Conception." So we get to the play. I wasn't part of the preparation. I just would wield all the guys in. And I'm seeing Mary there standing there in her pink sweater. And and she she starts off, introduces the play, and then and, and now Bernadette comes to the grotto. And and so there's she's pretending she's picking up flowers. And then and then Debbie comes in dressed uh, dressed up. No, Nyla comes in dressed up as a blessed mother into the steps to be like an apparition, you know. And Debbie goes, who are you? And Nyla goes, hi. Hi, I, no, she, yeah, she goes, hi, I'm Nyla. <laughs> and, and the other, the woman there goes, you dumb bee. Oh, God. <laughs> I know. The sisters just gasped. You dumb bee, you're supposed to say you're the immaculate con <laughs> conception. So I tell it in the book, but it was George Howell. George, every time he sees me, he tells me how many people he's told that story to. That is very funny. But, but it was funny. I mean, and I remember Mary just covering her face with the notebook because <laughs> obviously that was not the script, you know. <laughs> but the sisters all have a great sense of humor, and uh, but they that one was kind of a shocker. Yeah, but yeah, Mary, I to discern. Mother was very clear about discernment that you had to pray, and she mm -hmm. said to me, "Listen to God; He'll tell you what to do." And I, I would like, could you be more concrete? <laughs> You know, but she really knew mm. that God would lead you and discern, you know. and If you took the time to pray, she's if saying. If you prayed. For your vocation, if you're called to marriage, you're dating someone. If yeah. you pray, she was saying, God will lead you. And to get counsel from wise people, you know, that are prayerful so that, that, that you're discerning this together so you're not deceiving yourself. Mm. 
I remember one time she said to me, she said, if Jesus puts you in the palace, be all for Jesus in the palace, but make sure he put you there. Mm-hmm. And I've thought about that a lot. And, uh, and I think with mother, uh, in discerning matrimony, she always felt like as long as it's not self-willed and if it's something that's not, you know, but if it's going to be, cause she always said, you know, the family that prays together stays together. So she wanted to make sure there was this union of hearts, this desire to follow Jesus to, you know, that that was the key to a marriage was prayer because you know how hard it is with little kids. Mm-hmm. They wipe you out and then you have nothing good with, for your spouse. You know, we had five and, and it was, boy, Mary and I, you know, we thank God for it, but it was hard. Mm-hmm. And by the way, mother told us, she said, I want you to have five children, one for each of the joyful mysteries. I you know, love that. How about that? I'd love to get to five. <laughs> uh, what would you say, what do you think Mother Teresa's advice would be to a young woman like me? I guess I'm in my 30s now, a youngish mom like me and other young women and men. But let's start with the women specifically. What, what would her advice be? Well, Mother uh, was a mother. I mean, the, 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 when you look at her, her maternal love, mm-hmm. she was the most Mary-like person since Mary, a virgin and mother to the world. Mm-hmm. And she saw the heroic sacrifice her own mother had made, mm-hmm. and she saw all of the lay people in her lifetime and the sacrifices. So many, often it is the mother that's left there with the children and the responsibilities, the challenges, the feeding, the sleep, the sick kids, the whole deal. So she always wanted, she said, pray the work, you know, and to mm. to let God use you without consulting you. And so to be open to what the day was and to celebrate it and to just be a mother, to be present to the work. She was a big fan of, you know, obviously she knew that there were situations where women had to be separated from their kids so they could go earn money to pay. You know, that's not uncommon mm. in the third world to leave the children with an aunt and uncle or someone, mm. family, or even friends to go work. But she was big on the family. And, and on the role that the mother plays in it. And in an age now today where motherhood is denigrated, mm-hmm. attacked, of course it was going to be if you allowed abortion. So of course motherhood was going to be attacked and birthing persons and all this nonsense, all the gender nonsense. It all started really, I believe, with this attack on motherhood. On the It's what Genesis and Revelations, all of these great scriptures mm-hmm. point to is this attack on the woman. And uh, so mother was, a, you know, encouraged women in their vocations to to pray and to, you know, have time for each other. And mother said to marry me, she goes, you should have a proper home. You know, don't try to live like the MC's life, have a proper home, you know, and just choose not to have some things, you know, mm-hmm. so that life of choosing not to have. And so what choose- does that look like for you all? Uh, <laughs> well, Mary and I choose different things not to have. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean... The life of choosing not to have means you have to, mm-hmm. you have to grow together. You know, mm-hmm. if you want, you know, if you want to think of yourself as a saint, live alone, mm-hmm. right? So when you live in marriage and family life, there's going to be struggles and trials, and that's part of the growth is that mm-hmm. we learn how to, to love in the midst of that, mm-hmm. and to uh, not pick at the speck in their eye, but to deal with the plank in our own mm-hmm. eyes. And so mother was very pragmatic, extremely pragmatic. The advice she would give to people, I would watch her in discussions, you know, where she was just very direct. And if she had a light, she would give it, you know, if it, even if it meant separate from that situation, she would tell the people that. So she was, she followed the Holy Spirit, incredible judgment. Mm-hmm. Never, I worked for a U.S. president, I worked for a U.S. senator, governor, never, never knew anyone that had the judgment she had. And you think that's sourced in her prayer? I do. I believe it was the wisdom of God that was given to her because she was so receptive that she could receive it, and she always felt it was for others. And and I think it was to the extent of her love, you know, that she loved until it hurt, and she uh, trusted that the Lord would equip her for the battle, and she had battles, you know. Mm-hmm. She was tried, and she spoke of the devil often, you know, in letters to me she wrote about, you know, the devil's mm-hmm. mad, angry, in Haiti, she wrote in one letter to me, mm-hmm. you know, because they were doing work there, you know. So mm-hmm. she's still in, the sisters are in Gaza, Ukraine, mm-hmm. they have to pray. Mm-hmm. You know, without prayer, they would be, I, they'd be at the mercy of the world, but with prayer, they're united with Christ. And so they're still, they didn't leave Haiti. They're in Syria. They're in Yemen. They're, you know, these women and, and the priests that are in Nairobi, mm. it's just beautiful to see. Did you ever see Mother Teresa give practical, specific advice to married people, especially married mothers? And I'm asking this because obviously the plan of life for an MC for Missionary of Charity includes, you know, holy hour, mass. It has these certain prayer 
uh, responsibilities that they have to keep them close to their life source, which is Jesus Christ. When you're a busy mom, you can't do the exact plan of life that maybe you would have done before becoming a mom. Did she ever advise Mary or you? And what did that look like? She she certainly said you, you have to be respectful of your station in life and to pray mm-hmm. the work. So even if you couldn't be in the chapel, she knew that the religious life allowed them this undivided time and adoration, the liturgy of the hours, all the things that you can do when you're single, you know, but when you were, when you're married and you have children, it's very difficult to do those things, to find time for the rosary. So, you know, prayed in the car, mother Mm. showed, you know, we would, when I would drive her, she would take my rosary, give me hers and we'd pray a rosary while we were driving somewhere because mother uh, prayed. Uh, Mm. But she, she was big on balance, you know, that, that there'd be time for recreation, like her Mm. sisters get recreation and that there was time for rest and that, and to make sure that you had time for each other, you know, that you would have date nights and things. Mother was very pragmatic. So, yeah, I think without prayer, uh, we won't have the patience. We, you know, you won't grow in the virtues. You know, Mother became a saint not because she was a foundress or a mystic. She became a saint through the heroic practice of Christian virtue. That's the test of the Vatican. And it was through that practice of virtue and community life with Mother and for you and me in our married states to... Uh, to, that it's how do we practice virtue in the midst of all these challenges and how do we, in the school of mercy, you know, because mother did not think that that marriage was about happiness. It was about holiness. And uh, so that's going to be a trial. You know, there's going to be a cross and there's no authentic Christian life that doesn't have one. And she knew that. In today's modern world, it can be very difficult to take the time and the space to pray and even to know how to pray. That's why I love the Hallow app. The Hallow app is the number one Christian app in the world. It's been downloaded over 15 million times and it helps us deepen our relationship with God. When you use the Hallow app, you get access to over 10,000 guided prayers, meditations, stories, and other content to help you with your prayer. Whether you're driving in your car or you're doing dishes or you're just going about your day and you just need five to 10 minutes to sit down and focus on what matters most, your relationship with God, Hallow app will help you do that. With Hallow, you'll learn to pray with scripture using the Bible. You'll also discover prayers that have been prayed by Christians for thousands of years. I also love that Hallow takes some of the most beautiful and the best spiritual classics and incorporates them for you into your daily prayer life. Right now, there's a special challenge going on with Hallow to rediscover the Christian classic by C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity was one of the key books for me that helped me in my journey and my walk with Jesus Christ. And what Hallow is doing is taking excerpts from Mere Christianity and doing guided prayer times after reading through the excerpts. There's all kinds of fun challenges on the Hallow app to help you improve your prayer life and again, access to every kind of prayer that you can imagine. I especially love the kids' content on Hallow. I use it with my kids, and they also have wonderful sleep prayers and sleep stories that you can use to help you wind down at the end of a long day. You can download Hallow for free for three months when you go to the link in the description or go to hallow.com slash Lila. That's hallow.com slash Lila. Download Hallow today and deepen your prayer walk with God. You mentioned earlier, and I'm going to ask you too about um, aging with dignity, but you also mentioned her dark night of the soul and the darkness that she wrestled with. And there was another book alongside uh, your great book here to love and be loved, which we're going to put in the description notes for people to get access to. But there's the book, come be my light, which is publishing her letters, many of which include her wrestling with the spiritual darkness that she experienced. And I think there is maybe a lot of confusion about what that means, because some people think that that means that she didn't no, she didn't have confidence or trust in God's love for her. So there's mm-hmm. that misunderstanding. And I think there's also a misunderstanding where when people feel an aridity in their own prayer life or a dryness, like they feel a maybe a distance from God, they think, oh, that's, I'm in a dark night, you know, maybe like Mother Teresa, or maybe they have a lot of negative feelings or they lack feelings in their prayer. And so they might think, oh, I'm having this dark night. But there's something very specific that the dark night that Mother Teresa experienced meant. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about that and what you observed being so close to Mother Teresa in the last 12 years? Yeah, it was, it floored us to find out that she had experienced this sense of being abandoned and forsaken. When, when Father Brian sent me the galley proofs to come be my light to read for the first time before it was published, you know, just to do a legal review, I was stunned by it. I, I called Sister Normal. I was like, 
wait a minute, did you know this, that mother had felt this and written? No, she had no idea. So mother didn't tell anyone. If I had had that, I'd have been complaining to everybody, you know, like, oh, where's God, you know, and she never said it. She told her confessor, though. She did in letters Mm -hmm. under obedience. She did. And and she shared it and and wrote it out, poured out her heart. I mean, when you read those letters, they're powerful. Mm -hmm. And um, I came, I wrote a chapter on it, but uh, I think the church is going to spend hundreds of years because it was a very prolonged, lengthy period of utter darkness. When you read Padre Pio's biographies, when you read the Little Flowers biography, you see that they went through these same periods of darkness. The extraordinary thing about mothers was it it just never let up. And so she learned to befriend the darkness. But like I was in her hospital room with her in 1996 when she had had a heart attack. She was there in Calcutta. She had the Blessed Sacrament directly in front of her bed. She had an image of the Blessed Mother here, one of the little flower here. There was no doubt in her mind where she was going. You know, Time Magazine had put on the cover, you know, when those letters came out that did Mother Teresa lose faith, you know, like you said, no, but that's the secular take. Mother knew that Jesus was with her. She she took, she just had the darkness of faith. But when she received communion, when she was with the Word, when she was with the poor, it was holy. Mm-hmm. So Mother knew, but she just had learned to accept the darkness. But what did that mean that she experienced darkness? Was that like an emotional uh, experience that she had where she wasn't feeling good emotions in prayer? Can you... What, what did it mean? I, you know, when you read her letters, it, 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 it describes it. So it's kind of hard to paraphrase... Mm-hmm these gut wrenching, you know, that you've abandoned your early love for me and that you, you know, you've hit, you're hidden yourself from me and you've abandoned me and forsaken. I've, I came to accept the fact that, that when she spoke of being forsaken, it was it, sharing in what Jesus had said, you know, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, forsaken me? You know, she was experiencing in his holy humanity, mm-hmm. in her humanity, she was experiencing that. Um, and, and I think, yeah, there was that lost sense of the intimacy that she once enjoyed it was gone. And um, when you read the, her visions that she had had that described that intimacy, you can see why the contrast was so mm. dramatic. But when we were with her, we had no idea. I saw how hard she worked physically, mm. the hours she kept. I kept thinking, well, the Lord's whispering mm. sweet nothings in her ear, and that's how she had all this energy. And to find out it was exactly the opposite. But I think the Lord allowed her those experiences so that she could enter into the experience of the poor and their being abandoned, unloved, unwanted, unwelcome. I think Mother experienced that in that small way. And do you think it could be also that because she had had these intense consolations, like the visions she had had this, like, almost like this euphoria of experiencing the delight of God in her and being, you know, the spouse of God. Now she's, you know, this consecrated religious. I mean, that whole experience, having so much tremendous consolations that she experienced, once that maybe was removed and she's now like in in the thick of it, like the intensity of what she was doing without having that same consolation, it's easier to feel the darkness when you felt the light, you know? I think that's right. And the intensity of that love she felt. I think that's right. And experienced in every way, not just in the order of senses, but also even in the order of faith. She was illumined about the thirst of Christ for love and for souls. This was the charism of the missionaries of charity. Mm -hmm. That's why if you go to a missionaries of charity chapel anywhere in the world, you'll see the crucifix in the chapel and you'll see the words, I thirst right next to it, you know, because that was at the heart of her spiritual uh, awareness of what God communicated to her. So, yeah, I think she just came to accept it and she just trusted him and she felt if that's what God was asking of her, she would give it. That's why she, when she prayed, you know, that she wouldn't refuse him anything. I think that was one of the things he took from her, but she came to accept it and you just never knew it. And she wrote about it in the letters that, that her cheerfulness was a cloak she wasn't being a hypocrite. She was basically just doing, uh, you know, just aware of the fact there's a happy ending to this. She truly knew she was going home to God. I mean, when I, mm-hmm. she knew she came from God and was going home to God, it was that simple to her. You know, when I, uh, when I saw her before that, that time before she died, uh, I was said, mother, I'm going to miss you so much when you're on the other side. And, and she said, I have my bags packed. You know, she had her bags packed. She was, she would knew where she was going. There was no doubt in her mind where she was going. So, I mean, people didn't want to distort it. Just like the chapter I have in the book on the critics, mm-hmm. it's very fashionable now to troll mother on the internet. 
And if you troll her, you, I mean, if you put in some keywords, you'll see how awful and ugly it's gotten. It's all untrue. So I, it's just you think that's a demonic attack. All the yeah. critics of Mother Teresa saying she was, you know, trafficking and right. all these sick accusations right. about inverting the beautiful work she did to care for the poor. Right. Somehow she was hurting them, right. hurting children. Right. No, there that there's criticisms. I rebut them in the book uh, because it's fashionable now. But, but there's an attack on the holy. I mean, look at the oppression that we see now in the world, where the truth's been turned upside down. Whenever you see all these lies that are going on and then the lack of leadership in the world where there's really, you know, where is the leadership, you know? So thank God for our church and for the, where we make our spiritual home. And mother loved, you know, she said, I love all religions, but I'm in love with my own, you know? And she was able to operate in, in an environment where she just loved. And, uh, and I think that the world now there's growing fears and, you know, but our hope's not in God. It's in, mm -hmm. I mean, our hope's not in government. It's in God. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's our savior. Government's not our savior. Mother Teresa encouraged you and even asked you to start your organization, Aging with Dignity. Tell me more about why she asked you to do that and what Aging with Dignity Well, does. I was talking to her about the assisted suicide clouds that were forming in Florida at that time in 1995, 96. Mm -hmm. And I was worried about it. And I felt like if we, as we saw with abortion and the polarized debate, I felt if we could get the discussion about what good end-of-life care looked like, because I had lived in the AIDS home for a year and I'd seen it, and I wrote a document called Five Wishes, which helps families plan for discuss end-of-life care. It's a legal document. I had the American Bar Association help me. It's now 43 million copies out there in, in 33 languages. So by God's grace, that's being used mm. uh, to help families have a hopeful vision of end-of-life care without embracing the lie of assisted suicide that somehow that's going to solve the problems of the dying and disabled. When you look at the world today, it's frightening to see how quickly this has taken hold. 10 states, the District of Columbia have legalized assisted suicide. Eight countries, uh, youth in Asia, 14 assisted suicide countries. Mm -hmm. Netherlands killed 10,000 people, euthanized 10,000 people. In Oregon, where they've had assisted suicide forever, they always say, oh, well, we'll have mental health you know, they always have these so-called protections, you know, we'll have mental health services. One out of 50 got the mental health screen. One out of 50. Of those killed by assisted suicide yes. in yeah. Oregon. So you see that wow. all these so-called protections, they just, they put in these strict guidelines and then proceed to just move all the guardrails, dismiss them, waiting periods. Now look at Canada. They've, they've, uh, they, they now allow assisted suicide. They call it medical aid and dying. You know, they're already engineering the language just like they do at abortion medical aid and dying. And uh, to have physicians, instead of caring now, they're killing patients. And that's called compassion. Fortunately, American Medical Association hasn't bought that argument. But, you know, it's a matter of time before the woke gets to that mm -hmm. point. But I think a better way to go, uh, we focus our attention on good end-of-life care, good palliative care, hospice care, family communications, helping people pray that time, see that God's waiting so it's a challenge for the churches to do their job and to help people see that aging is not a curse, it's a blessing. So Aging with Dignity has a bunch of programs, seminars, webinars, training healthcare professionals with our Five Wishes document, and now our new Finishing Life Faithfully document, which is an end-of-life guide for Catholics that takes all the church mm -hmm. teachings, 60 footnotes. Cardinal Dolan, Cardinal O'Malley, a uh, bunch of my bishop friends have endorsed it or promoting it in the Diocese Cardinal or Archbishop Laurie in Baltimore is giving it to every one of his priests. Mm -hmm. So we have to help people. We can't just say you can't do this. You can see the sympathy, but if they see how the disabled are going to be pushed toward euthanasia, the right to die is going to become a duty to die, as a mm -hmm. bishop in England just said, because they're voting October 16th. They have the parliaments taking up the legalization of it in Britain. So it's scary. Uh, last year, Massachusetts, Delaware came real close to. Maryland, they're, they're all flirting with this and Compassion and Choices is pushing their agenda and it's awful. So a better way is to promote good end-of-life care and to help our disabled. And instead of killing a person, care for them, help, help them see what is it they need. A lot of times it's loneliness. They feel like they've been rejected or they're a burden and they don't feel they're a gift. So that's an invitation for us to visit nursing homes, assisted living facilities and help our own family members. Can you describe for people who might not understand what it means, assisted suicide. I think there's, again, it's even the, the, the word euthanasia is a sanitation, sanitizing of 
killing somebody, just right. like abortion right. is sanitizing, killing a baby. We talk a lot of live action about what abortions do. They starve to death. They dismember. I mean, really brutal acts against this developing new human life. But it's not like a walk in the park to die via assisted suicide. Can you describe what are the methods that are being used to kill not just elderly folks, but sometimes even children who have a debilitating condition or a disability? That's right. I mean, they, they had dozens of, of anorexic women, young women, some of them. A 17-year-old was just euthanized in the Netherlands. Horrific. Uh, for, a 17-year-old yeah, girl with anorexia, anorexia yeah. was killed who just by doctors to, yeah. in the Netherlands. Yeah. And so but assisted suicide is you, you want, you're, you've made the decision to end your life. And in most states, it's illegal to support a suicide. You know, we, when someone's up on a building about to jump, you don't sit there and go, oh, maybe it's good for them. Maybe it's the right thing. You know, we're wired for life. Mm. We, you know, we want to help them. What's wrong? You know, we're our brother's keeper. You know, this is the call. But, uh, but with assisted suicide, very often there's depression or there's pain that could be treated and is being poorly treated because sometimes medicine doesn't know when to stop and it keeps doing some procedures and ignoring the pain of people. So, yeah, I think that what has happened uh, with assisted suicide is, you know, a person is, they, they have certain guidelines in the state statutes that you have to be certain months of expected to die. And although interestingly enough, if you have a disability, you immediately qualify. So Horrible. this is how they're looking at it. So if you call a suicide hotline and you're disabled, you're presumed to be pushed toward assisted suicide. Where? In states that have it legal. Like Oregon. Yeah. And what like are the Oregon. other states, Jim? Oh, there, we have a list on our website mm -hmm. at Aging with Dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the states like Arizona don't even capture the data. California, of course, it's legal. California had the most assisted suicides last year. And how are these being performed? In the U.S. Is it lethal injection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they, so they but, have the patient, they up the morphine, and then they stick. Right. It's a cocktail of drugs to, to end their life, to immediately end their life. I've What's, heard some reports, Jim, that even in the process of these lethal injections, and by the way, they use similar poison for the baby in lethal injection abortions, which are all late mm -hmm. trimester abortions. They do a lethal injection of the baby. It's, it's, it's heinous. But for these patients like in California who are doing assisted suicide, they call it euthanasia, whatever they want to call it, aid in dying in, in Canada, I've heard reports that in some of these lethal injections that they're doing to kill these people, that it doesn't always, this idea that they just drift to sleep and they don't feel pain, that's not always the case, that sometimes they go into a, almost a paralytic mm. um, state where they feel, uh, uh, basically they're drowning, like they're drowning to death, but you don't see them in pain because they're paralyzed. Have you mm. heard this report? I've I've heard some of it, and quite frankly, I'm out of my uh, depth on that yeah, issue, the okay, medical yeah. consequences, the injection. But what I can tell you is what's really chilling is what precedes it, because it's often a bunch of adults that are pushing you and supporting a suicide. I mean, who does that? I understand people can be in a lot of pain. I understand the baby boomers want control. They want to call the shots at the end. They want death on their own terms. I get why there's there's some sympathy or support for it. But when someone, usually it's a cry for help when someone's talking about, I want to die, you know, to get underneath that and say, what's really going on? It's very many times it's they feel they're a burden to others or they're getting subtle signals from family members to, why don't mm -hmm. you finish this up? Because we can't stand your suffering. You know, I had a twin sister who died of ALS. It's a terrible disease, you know. She was cared for and loved till the very end. It's... You know, we, we have a responsibility to accompany people uh, when they're sick and dying, not to, to, to simply accelerate, you know, cut to the chase, you know, because the God, they're going home to God. These are, you know, it's a defiance in a way of life. But I, 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 it doesn't have to be a religious issue. People can approach it their own way. To me, if you care about the disabled and people who are fragile, get them help. You know, don't say your solution is for us to end your life because that is a slippery slope. And we're watching in Canada, they've now extended it to minors, to minors, no parental consent to minors, no mental health screening that's of consequence. You look at the waiting list to even see a doctor in Canada now. So they, they cultivate the very environment in which they cultivate despair. And then they say, mm -hmm. oh, here, we can end your misery quickly with this medical aid in dying or assisted suicide or euthanasia. But euthanasia, to your question, is simply any act or, or mission with the intent of ending someone's life.
And so it's the intent that that's the focus and the catechism explains this very clearly. Jim, how can people find your work with aging with dignity and also your guidance for how to prepare end of life care for individuals? Because if people have a, you know, a, a will, a living will, they have a trust, whatever, they have different uh, things they can set up to ensure that their health care at the end of their life is done in accordance with not just their faith, but I believe human rights to give they, them proper care. They can care. do two things. One is they can go to our website at agingwithdignity.org. Uh, or Google Five Wishes, it'll take them to it. At agingwithdignity.org, you'll see Finishing Life Faithfully prominently displayed, and this is the new guide for Catholics on end-of-life care. Um, you, but the other is to start having discussions in your parishes. We, we, mm -hmm. When's the last time you heard a sermon at church about end-of-life care, mm -hmm. right? You know, how many sermons do you or hear abortion. on... Or abortion. We yeah. need both. Those are like the two right. biggest... Uh, things that are happening culturally is how we care for the youngest and the oldest and the sick. Right. And our society legally system systems are being weaponized against the youngest, the eldest and the sick. That's right. Mm. And so I think the more that we start to discuss this issue, baby boomers think they're going to live forever, but unless you're Elvis Presley, you're not, you know, so mm. you've got to start addressing these questions of end of life care mm. and uh, and having family discussions where people come together and say there's a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and this person's going to change. They sometimes say that's two deaths. You know, you lose the person once and then you lose them finally. Mm -hmm. Well, you commit, you come together and commit and say, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to accompany you. Your pain's going to be managed. You're going to be prayed for it and loved. So that's why Five Wishes took off because it talks about also comfort, dignity, how I want to be remembered, what I want my loved ones to know, who do I forgive all these tools in addition to the living will and durable power of attorney for health. So yeah, we need to start having these discussions and we need to be careful. Compassionate Choices has an agenda. They are pushing assisted suicide. They're the former Hemlock Society. They're trying to change the word suicide so nobody uses it. It's bad manners now to use it. It's not. It's suicide. And when you take your own life, and I'm not judging anyone, and the Lord is solely the one that judges, including the hearts. And I had a close friend commit suicide, and I don't judge where he is. I know the Lord saw his troubled condition, and so I understand it. But as a society, are we really going to start making the disabled so uncomfortable that they have a duty to die, that they should get out of the way, do the decent thing? Because when you get to be with disabled people, you say they love their lives. You know, they fight every day to be alive. It's so hard to be have Parkinson's, hard to be in a wheelchair all day long, you know, so they love their lives. It's meaningful, and they give lives to, life to others, their kids, the grandkids that are around it. So we have to rediscover the beauty, too, that comes in that season in life. It's not all just darkness, despair, you know. It's the cross, yes, but there's also at the cross in this suffering, meaning in that suffering, and we sometimes lose the sense of that. I'm sure Mother Teresa is very proud uh, of what you're doing, Jim. I don't know. I'm, I got to pay. It's like a credit card debt. I'm trying to pay it off. I could, I'm barely keeping up with the interest payments. So I'm not going to. But yeah, I, I obviously Mary and I and our children have a debt too. So yeah, thank you. And thank you for what you do. Of course. You have a lot of courage. How, and what, grace. What, any, any final words that you think Mother Teresa might want to share if she were alive today? Let's just stay with our podcast. I don't know if that's too, too intense to ask with the people listening. And yeah, society at large, the way the world is today. What do you think Mother Teresa would say? Well, on her tombstone is John 15, 12, love one another as I have loved you. When society heeds that command, there's a flourishment of grace and kindness and all the virtues. When we ignore that, we get into the kind of contentious politics we see today and the breakdown in between men and women, the attack on motherhood, the attacks on marriage, all the things that we see today that have taken place when we stop loving one another as God loves us. So I think mother would urge people to, to pray and to reorient their lives to that they realize they came from God and we're going home to God. And that this journey, maybe it seems insignificant, but there's no insignificant life. That's been your ministry, you know, to, to talk about the beauty of that unborn child and to be a voice for that that beautiful life, you know, and for, and to also help the mothers who made those regrettable decisions to become aware that their lives can now be a gift and, and not be lived in shame. And so I do think that your ministry and live action and what you're doing is a grace and uh, keep it up because it's not easy, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Where can people find To Love and Be Loved? 
Uh, well, it's on obviously at Amazon, mm -hmm. and uh, if you just Google it, uh, it, Aging with Dignity sells it, but uh, you can get it Barnes and Noble. I mean, Simon Schuster didn't exactly promote the book, uh, but it's out there, and I feel like the sisters liked it. That was my primary audience, <laughs> and Mary and I are giving all the royalties mm -hmm. to the MCs and to uh, pro life and other causes that aligned with mother. So. Uh, we're not keeping any of the money, mm -hmm. so buy it. <laughs> Jim, thank you so much. Thank you. It's truly an inspiration, and what a joy to get to talk to you. Well, I finally met Lila Rose. <laughs> and I've met Jim Tui. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.